In a tier list of the most powerful and seductive shapers of culture, the temptress that is fashion easily ranks amongst the top tier. We've all been bitten by this bug. It's the first day of fourth grade and you're strutting your way down the hallway, all eyes drawn to your new Spongebob Heelys, but your undeveloped brain forgets that wheels on shoes equals no stick to floor and one wrong step sends you plummeting, showering the hallway in colored pencils, Yu-Gi-Oh cards, and shame. We've all been there. Right? But while people often reminisce about the dapper fashion of the good old days, they usually aren't referring to the more ridiculous or outright baffling trends that have existed. So get comfy and buckle up your supreme seatbelts, because on today's field trip, we're touring the world of absurd trends, styles, and fashion throughout history. And there were a lot of these, so if you want a part 2, make sure to let me know in the comments. Hobbling is the act of strapping together an animal's legs to prevent them from moving too quickly. This practice proved useful throughout history for preventing your horses, donkeys, or women from running away. Wait. Introducing the Hobble Skirt, a dress designed to obstruct a woman's stride with its tight-fitting hem, perfect for all your duck-waddling appreciation parties. Credit for the skirt was claimed by French designer Paul Poiret, whose design quickly replaced the corset as the staple of high fashion in 1908, leading him to state, Yes, I freed the bust, but I shackled the legs. It's not entirely clear where Paul allegedly came up with the design. Some say it may have originated from the first woman to fly in an airplane, who tied a rope around her skirt to prevent it from blowing up in the wind. But I have a different theory. Perfection. Obviously, the trend came with certain mobility-related complications, such as crossing a street, or going upstairs, or just, you know, living a life. Things like boarding streetcars became especially difficult, so I guess they're just gonna have to wear something else for daily transit. Oh, or you could just have the city design modified streetcars specifically for hobble skirts. But as everyone knows, you're not a great trend until you've had your fair share of untimely deaths. One woman drowned falling off a bridge in New York, while another was killed trying to outrun a loose horse at a racetrack in Paris. <laughs> But don't worry, the onset of World War I saw the decline of the speed limit skirt, with its impractical design not really suiting a wartime atmosphere. Thanks, World War I. You really saved a lot of lives. When you hear the word hermit, many often think of the adorable little crustaceans occasionally found as pets. Others, a sweaty neckbeard grinding for RuneScape XP in his mom's basement. However, a true hermit has more in common with the latter, opting for a life of isolation where instead of grinding for XP, they grind for spiritual enlightenment. These secluded eccentrics often lived lives of peace and meditation contemplating the meaning of life. And so naturally, British aristocrats thought they'd make perfect garden gnomes. Good morning, friendly travelers! And what a wonderful morning it is! Perfect for embodying the spirit of the youthful rabbit, frolicking in God's greatest gift! Oh, look, George, we simply must have one in the garden. Oh, thank you, but I- Damn it, Martha, you're right! It fit in perfect next to the tulips. Forget the elaborate hedges and neatly trimmed lawns. In 18th century Britain, your estate wasn't worth mentioning unless you had yourself an ornamental hermit. Basically, you'd build a simple brick or stone building called a hermitage and pay some guy to live in it, decorating it with tree root shells and bones in what was pretty much the 18th century equivalent of your lovable crackhead dumpster dweller. In exchange for lodging, food, and a stipend, they were expected to spend their days in isolation, where they wouldn't bathe, cut their hair, or engage in any kind of recreation or social mingling. They served as entertainment for guests walking through the estate, where they could approach the hermit and pick up a little nugget of wisdom. Invest in Dogecoin you should, a dollar soon it shall be. I... I don't understand. He's reached a level of enlightenment we can never hope to achieve, Catherine. Kanye 2024. Wow, such wisdom. But finding a real hermit wasn't as easy as it is today, where all it takes is pulling up Pokemon's Twitch chat, so some estates had to post advertisements for the position. Turns out, asking a man to dedicate their life to social exile solely for the entertainment of the British elite is rather difficult, leading a few estates to actually use mechanical dummies instead. So if you were updating your resume hoping for a job as an aristocrat's quirky little poverty exhibit, think again, because not even that job is safe from being replaced by automation. This trend fell out of style by the 19th century, but if you're hoping to visit a hermit, you're still in luck. There's a hermitage in the mountains of Austria that's been continuously inhabited for the past 350 years. Or if that's too far, you just go to Portland. The American song Yankee Doodle has been sung for hundreds of years and is nearly famous enough to replace the US national anthem. Toxic by Britney Spears. But it turns out, the famous lyric about macaroni isn't actually talking about those delightful curvy carb tubes, but a ridiculous 18th century British fashion by the same name. Characterized by their outlandishly large wigs, vibrant colors, pointy shoes, unnecessary canes, and tiny hats, this eccentric fashion had 18th century Britain looking like a rock star made Grand Theft Carriage aristocrat city. The fashion originated from young men who went gallivanting around Europe on the Grand Tour, essentially the Georgian era equivalent of your typical rich kid gap year abroad for finding 
themselves. Just like all college-aged men, they developed a passion for macaroni while passing through Italy, using the word for its cultural sound to describe anything sophisticated or worldly, such as their new drip. Oh, oh my gosh, James, you look like a whole new man. Uh, what do you call this? Oh, this? Uh, just a little thing we picked up passing through good old Italia. I call it macaroni. <gasps> So ethnic. But while the ultra elite enjoyed how this expensive, over-the-top fashion distinguished themselves from those yucky poor people, macaroni soon began to fall out of favor. Given their exaggerated and often flamboyant appearance, the term began to refer to excessive fashion and male femininity, which at the time was rather frowned upon. Trust me, they want to be colonized. <gasps> g -g 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 Whether or not macaroni was ridiculed because it suggested homosexuality is unclear. But regardless, mocking the trend became another popular British pastime, right up there with playing cricket and selling opium. After a lot of heat from magazines and cartoonists, the fashion fell out of style after only a decade. But don't worry, the rich will find other quirky ways to express themselves. When you think of history's manliest sex symbols, there are probably quite a few individuals who come to mind. No, not me, stop it. King Henry VIII, especially in his youth, could be considered one such individual, and he wasn't really subtle about it. To highlight his fertility, Henry VIII was particularly fond of wearing a codpiece, a type of flapper pouch protruding from a man's trousers, kind of like a genital birdhouse. While he didn't start the fashion trend that became popular during the 15th century, he certainly embraced it with open arms. Or I guess legs. So much so that you'd be hard pressed to find a portrait of him without it. His armor is on display at the Tower of London, sporting a whopping two and a half pound codpiece, which was sure to make him look quite submissive and breedable on the battlefield. Apparently, others thought so too, seeing as how women used to stick pins in its leather lining in hopes of increasing their chances of getting pregnant. Because you know, nothing quite screams healthy family like the dude who beheaded two of his six wives. His codpiece was so iconic that there used to be a wooden statue of him also at the Tower of London, equipped with a secret mechanism. To activate it, one only needed to to step on the right spot on the floor. Uh, hey, where's the codpiece? That's kind of a shtick. <laughs> Check this out. You've done it again, Tom. The fashion blossomed in Europe until the 16th century, coming in many shapes and sizes. And each time you think it couldn't get crazier, Google Images steps in to prove you wrong. I'm particularly fond of the German cod pieces. I don't know what they were going for with this one, but to me it looks like a weird Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone fan fiction. You know, the one where Voldemort attaches himself to Professor Quirrell's other head. Avada Kedavra. So while it may seem like the fads of today are as stupid as they come, clearly history has had its fair share of trendy hiccups to hopefully give you a little more faith in humanity. Uh, or not. As you look back at what was in vogue in centuries past, it makes you wonder, and perhaps excited, to see what may become stylish in our lifetimes. Not me, though. Fashion has already failed me on that fateful day many moons ago. Fourth grade was a long time ago, Blue Jay. You need to let go. I can still hear them. <laughs> the laughs. <laughs> oh god, they just get louder. And remember what we say to them when we hear the voices? <laughs> Blue Jay? P beauty is pain. Louder. Beauty is pain. You're ready. So from hobbits in your garden to towers on your noggin, I think it's safe to say weird historical fashion gets 6 out of 11 out of 10 stars. <laughs>